back in First Peter as we continue uh, our series in First Peter. We've been looking at uh, various sections, and I've, I've come to take a look at a larger pericope or section of Scripture tonight. And I think you'll see why. I trust you'll see why, because I, I think there's a perspective that Peter is giving us from uh, verses uh, 10 through 12 that is good for us uh, to look at as we come to these individual duties, to always remember the gospel-centeredness of our Christian life. Well, by way of introduction to the text tonight then, or this morning rather, uh, earlier this week I saw a blog that was titled, The Good Life, Four Easy Secrets Backed by Research. Oh, that, that backed by research certainly caught my eye, and so I had to read that blog and discover what this blogger thought was the good life. Would you like to know what those grand secrets are, those four secrets that they give to us? Are you ready for it? Smile, laugh, touch, and tease. And here are the grand secrets of a good life. Well, there is something to be said for simplicity, I suppose, and people love the simplistic. But I think most people would intuitively know that these kinds of maxims and platitudes are often very shallow in the face of the realities of life. They lack the divine sanction, the weightiness of God's authority. And I, I think that most will know that the good life is much more than a smile. It's much more than a laugh or a touch or a tease, this short article on the good life actually closed by a quote from the philosopher, from the 19th century philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, whose philosophy gave the green light to Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. I found it profound, profoundly sad to approvingly quote from a philosophical nihilist on the meaning of a good life. Go and look that one word up in the, in the dictionary if you must, but it is, to say the least, a contradiction in terms. Good life, nihilist. Good life, nihilist. They don't seem to belong in the same basket, do they? Well, many attempts to distill the meaning of life have been attempted, not by this blogger only, but by people all through history. In our times, we find the late night entertainers and as well as daytime talk show hosts foist rebranded human philosophies upon the unsuspecting, upon the disaffected, and oftentimes on the disenfranchised of a culture and a society. Each one of them giving their version of you got it, the good life and what it's meant to be. Many will take the words out of the Declaration of Independence about the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and there you go. That's what it is to have the good life. Well, you'll find, and I know you have, but we'll find many opinions, multitudes of opinions about the so-called good life on the Internet, on social media, Entertainment industry, libraries, religions, politics, and from the neighbors next door. You'll also find pictures, advertising, lives that are built around friends and family, houses, good food, great times, adrenaline rush, wealth, security, power, reputation, or even a sacrificial service at some point. Let's go save the planet. All of these become catnip to the restless souls in search of the good life. Now, let me hasten to say that not all of these opinions or things in and of themselves are necessarily bad. That's not what I'm saying here today. It is certainly good to smile. It is certainly great to laugh. And the scripture has quite a few things to say about these things. And it is certainly great to to have a warm hand put upon your shoulder, someone to let you know that they're there for you. And it's quite all right to have a tease with a spouse or with a friend 
to hold each other accountable. However, you also know that a smile can be deceiving. You can realize later that someone who was smiling at you was all the while plotting against you. A laugh can be cruel. Instead of laughing with you, they're laughing at you. A touch can be much more than that. It can actually bring harm. A tease? You middle schoolers know a tease can be merciless, right? It hurts when people tease you in a harsh way. So how can we know then what the good life is supposed to be? Well, here's a novel idea for you. Let's ask, let's ask the one with the power and wisdom to create humanity in the first place. God made us and holds the plans and specs for life in his hands. God knows what the good life is supposed to be. He invented it. You don't take your broken Toyota to a child's lemonade stand to get repaired, do you? Why would you take your broken life to anyone but God? So let's learn that God has designed a good life for his children. God has designed a good life for his children. And it behooves us, it becomes us to find out what that is that he has said in his holy word. And I've got three specifications for you then. Now, years ago, I worked in an industry that had a lot of specifications. They had books of specifications for jobs and anything and everything on that job, right down to the carpet on the floor and the fabric that was used, the materials in the building, the metal, the wood, you name it. There was a specification somewhere written down for that substance. Well, God has a spec book for us, and we're going to look at three such specifications from our text and just a little bit beyond. We're going to go back and grab some information from the first two chapters to fill out specification number two. So first of all, the first spec we find here in verse 10 is the desire for life, to love and to see good days. That's the first specification, desire for life. God has written the plan. He has written the book. And he has put in your heart, and he has put in the heart of every living being, Christian, he has put it into the hearts of every human being to seek to understand something about the good life. Now look at the verse again, verse 10. And you'll notice this is a quotation. This is a quotation from Psalm 34. Psalm 34 says in that place this very same scripture. It's a quotation here. Those who desire life and love, it's, it reads it in the Hebrew, love to see good days. He must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So specification number one from this text is there is a desire for life. God doesn't speak things for naught. He doesn't put superfluous words in his holy book. When God says that there is a desire for life, you know it's true. Now, yes, some people come to a point that they've lived and they've hurt and they say they want to die. We understand that. We've seen people in that condition. And some of you may have been in a condition like that at some point. But you also know and should recognize that that desire for life that is among mankind on a general level. Men want to live. They want to retain. The Lord Jesus spoke of the woman who had given all of her living to, try, uh, to doctors for years to be healed as evidence of that desire for life and to live. It's who we are. We want to live. The will for a human being to live is fantastic. It's amazing what people will go through. 
And it's one of the, one of the features at, a, we'll say, a box office movie or a good thriller. A plane crashes on top of a mountain in a remote area. And the things that people will go through to preserve their life because they have this desire to live. The book of Ecclesiastes recognizes this in Holy Scripture when God says there through Solomon that he has put eternity in their hearts. This is an expression of saying they want to live on. They want to have being. And so we find God is speaking very clear through his apostle when he says there is this desire. Now, the, the word thelos, desire here in the, the language, is, it simply means that. A wish, a will, a strong urge for this, a desire to have this. And so the first condition is that there must be in the heart a desire for this good. Do you recognize it? Do you see it? Do you sense it in you that you have a desire for a good life? Though you may not know what it is, you have a desire for it. Well, the second condition is that you must desire life. That's what it says. Desire life. Well, we know biological life, with our naturalist side of us, tells us we understand that very well. We can pinch it, and yes, it hurts. We understand the desire for, of the biological side of us to want to live. But as we've intimated already, we've said that there is something within us, the inner man, that also wants this life, this longevity, good days, a good amount of days. And so that's the second condition. There are two things in this, life, desire, and life itself. And what is it about life that we are desiring? Because this is a parallel phrase, the way it's translated here, the one who desires life, comma, to love and to see good days. Now, that doesn't mean he's not saying here, as, as you might want to read it, one who desires life, comma, to love, comma, and see good days. That's not the way it's written. It's the one who desires life, comma, to love and see good days. It's an extension of the first phrase, to love and see good days. That is, the love belongs to the good days, and see belongs to the good days. You love the thought of having good days. You long for good days. What is America? What is the world looking for in the midst of this pandemic right now? It's good days. Days where we don't have to wear masks. Days where we don't have to go and hide ourselves. Days in which we can walk up to a brother and slap him on the hand and say, shake my hand, brother. We, we want good days, don't we? And so we know this is a truism. And it's to love these good days, to have a, a, an affection for this. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a holy desire when it emanates from a holy heart. To see good days is a good thing. God made them good. And so they should be enjoyed as good. And it's not only to love them, but to see them. To actually experience them. To travel through those good days. Not just to have an... Have a, oh, I remember this one day and it was the greatest and I just wish it could come back again. But to actually see those good days and to participate in them. What a joy that is for us. And that's something that God provides for us. So that's part of God's specification for life. He made us to want and desire this very thing. And so I ask you, do you have a desire for a good life? The good life. And we're going to explain, come shortly, what that is. But do you have a desire for it? The kind of life that only God can give. What higher good can you conceive of for your own being than life and life eternal? Life and life eternal. What higher standard, what higher calling could you be given then to have eternal life? 
Well, this brings me to the second specification, and it's, it's actually quite a bit longer in my thinking, the way that I'm looking at the text. Specification number two is this. This desire and this good life and this love of it that God has put within mankind, there are prerequisites to finding the good life in a fallen world. Now, we know what it is to go to a, a school, a class, a, a, maybe a college class, and there are prerequisites. You don't get to start out in advanced calculus. Usually, you have to start out with a much lower branch of mathematics. And as you work your way through that, then you can go to the advanced uh, calculus classes. And friends, there is a prerequisite to the good life found in God and God only. And it's only in Him that we may find it. Now, before we can find this good life, we need to know some things. We need to know what good and evil are. Look at verse 10. Again, the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil. Do you see the two principles here? Good, evil, evil, good. There's some things then we need to know about this. What is good and what is evil? Well, that's a very great question because in a day like ours, in which there's so much relativism that floats about and causes people to wonder if there are any absolute morals and absolute truths, and we don't have to hold to those things, do we? My friend, if there is not such a concrete idea as good, how can there be anything? How can there be an idea that there is an earth beneath you? How can there be an idea that there's a sky vaulted with beauty above you? How can you peer into the, the flower and look at all the complexity of that creation of God? How can you look within a human anatomy and look at all that God has put in us to make us live from conception unto the last breath? How can we say that and not know that there is good? Agathos, good. That which is beautiful in and of itself. And it's so wonderful to see in, in the creation of God in the Hebrew Scriptures that the word can be translated indeed beautiful. It has that conception when God looked at all that He said, all that He made rather, and He said, Behold, it is very good. God was pronouncing it beautiful, what He had made. And He says later on in Holy Scripture, He has made everything beautiful in its own time. Dear friends, what God has made is good and beautiful, and beauty may have fashions here on, on earth. It may have fashions that attend those things that are beautiful, but true beauty never changes. It never changes. True beauty doesn't need a, a panel of judges to tell you what's beautiful. True beauty is beautiful. It's right. It's good. And that's what we're speaking of here. God is good. And he's the very definition of beauty and of goodness. Himself, what he does, who he is, his promises that he keeps. He is goodness itself. And so we measure everything that is good by him. And everything that is opposite of him, therefore, by necessity, must be that which is lacking his goodness is known as evil. That which is wrong. That which is sinful. And so we find then that the very concept of good and evil, of necessity, involves the person and being of God. You cannot come to or subscribe to a sense of good and evil, beauty and ugliness without subscribing to the being of God Almighty. Ah, oh, dear friends, we need to know what good and evil are. We need to go back to His Word, to God's Word, and when He says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need to take him seriously. If we want to know what beauty is and what ugliness is, we need to be those like the book of Hebrews talks about. Senses are sharpened, knowing, discerning the difference between good and evil, having a conscience sharpened that way. Now, now that we've learned something about what good and evil are in the very person of God and His Word, the law that He gives. 
is good and holy and just. We must learn also that because of our sins, we cannot be good without Christ. There is no good life apart from Christ. There's no goodness that can be had before God. I'm not talking about comparing yourself with the guy down the street or the guy that wound up in the county jail last night. I'm talking about you as a moral creature in God's moral order before a holy God who's going to judge all mankind one day. There is no goodness apart from Christ. There is none who does good. No, not one, says Holy Scripture. We find that without the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have nothing, nothing to hope for in this life, nothing to look forward to in the next life. And people who think they would like to go to heaven but don't want to be good and be like Jesus in this world are going to be sorely disappointed if they ever got to heaven because to be with the Lord Jesus is to be with goodness itself. It's to be with what, that which is beautiful. Well, pressing forward, the third point under this specification, or we might say 2.3, is that trusting Christ you find the entrance to the good life. You want to know what the key is? You, you want to know what the real secret to success is? You want to know what research has backed up through eternity? It will show forth the results of this research that was done and given to us in God's holy book that those who trust in Christ find the way to the Father. This is what Jesus himself says to us in John chapter 4. Thomas asking the question, Lord, how do we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Lord Jesus made us to know that in trusting him, we have found the narrow gate. We have found the narrow way. We are now on our way to meet him personally in bodily form and to be in the presence of God forever and enjoy His company. Oh, dear friends, trusting Christ, you find the, the entrance to the good life. Look at back at chapter 1 in 1 Peter with me. And we read these words in Peter to the apostle, apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to these folks. In verse 2, he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Trusting in Christ is the way to life. And that's the key, the entrance, the gate. I just love the pictures drawn for us in that uh, analogy of the Christian life by John Bunyan in his Pilgrim's Progress. And as he comes to the gate, the little wicked gate that the evangelist pointed him to, and as he comes to it there, and he comes to the cross, and his sin, his burden falls off his back and rolls down into the tomb, the open tomb, never to be seen again, that burden of sin. And as he goes through the gate, and that not too long after he's walking in the highway of salvation, after going through that gate and that way of life, which is Christ, he looks across the way and he sees a couple of rogues jumping over the wall, getting into the way, they think. One's name was formalist and the other was hypocrisy. That's the only way they could get in the Christian way. And they made pro great protest that their forefathers had done this for many a year and there was the most stylish thing to do for them. Dear friends, Christ is the alone entrance to the good life. If you want to know life and good days, it's all predicated. All that Peter says here is predicated upon your being in Christ. You can't have it without Jesus. Well, then also trusting Christ 
as you trust Christ, you live the life you, you have been given in the light of gospel blessing. In the light of gospel blessing. I, I remember not long ago, I went with some dear friends of ours, and we went down to the bridal cave down in the Ozarks. And they love to get you down there, and then they'll turn the lights out just to let you have the sense of that utter darkness as you're so far beneath the surface of the earth. And it's dark. You can imagine. It's a darkness that can be felt almost. It's very, very dark. And when that light comes on, you just seem so grateful to be able to reach out and put sight to touch. So that when, as you're holding hands, maybe with your spouse, that you realize, I'm feeling her hand, but I can't see her. But then the light comes on. And dear friends, all of our lives now are lived in the light of gospel blessing. So this good life that we have is now blessed and sanctified, set apart by God so that we may live to Him. And what a joy that is for us to live in the light of these gospel blessings. And again in verses 13 down through verse 16 of the first chapter, therefore prepare your minds. Those of you who are saved in this manner and born again by Christ, Prepare yourself for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. All trusting Christ, you now live in light of these gospel blessings. That's the only way to holiness that is acceptable to our Father in heaven is in Christ. But then also, please note that the Word teaches us and Peter teaches us in this place that trusting God's Word is evidence of the good life. You want to know, am I really living the good life? Or is it what the world is saying is the good life out here? Are you really living the good life? Well, here's the evidence. That's found in verse 22 of chapter 1 and following. Listen. Since you have an obedience to the truth. And remember Jesus in John 17 says, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, Peter's going to explain it now. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God. And then he compares that to the flesh. The flesh is like grass, Isaiah says, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word which was preached to you. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And so we find here that the word of God and having a love for it is evidence of your being in the good life and the good life being in you. Well, also, gospel living while in this world is the good life. Living according to the principles of the gospel is the good life itself. If you address the Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So here the gospel, being in the gospel of Christ, is evidence of the good life. Now here's one other thing that I want us to grasp. This is very helpful for us. Membership in Christ's body is further evidence of the good life. To put it another way around, to be a church member of the visible church of Jesus Christ is an evidence that you are in the good life, in the good way. Now, it's not the conclusive evidence. 
It's not the sole evidence, but it is an evidence. In fact, so much so that the writers of the Westminster Confession of Faith tell us very plainly that it is impossible, that it is not the way that God has ordained, that people who are outside the arms of the visible church ordinary, and using the ordinary means of grace to find their way to heaven. That's how much so important this evidence can be. And where do I get this from? Listen to these words of Peter continuing in chapter 2 and coming to Him, Jesus, as a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. He who believes in the foundation of the church and is himself in him a living stone will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected became the very corner stone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom. They were also appointed. Oh, do you see how membership in Christ's body is further evidence of the good life being in you? But then I want us to mark for a little bit now the godly submission, that godly submission is a mark of those who have found the good life. We looked at this quite a bit in the last two Lord's Days. We looked at the submission for the Lord's sake to every human institution. We looked at servants being submissive to their masters and the example of Christ himself being submissive to the Father's will. In chapter 3, in the beginning portion, which we've read already, there's this portion about wives being submissive to your own husbands. And here's this beautiful character of submission that we've already dealt with so much before and laid so much stress upon because Peter does this in his writings. Being submissive. Being the one who says, Lord, your will be done, not mine. Lord, if it calls me to, to swallow this cup that's bitter in drinking now, Lord, I'll do it in submission to you. And that's what he's speaking of here in the first place to wives. And this points to a well-known truth in the Christian church that though men and women in the sight of God are absolutely equal as far as their status of being made in the image of God, there is no distinction in this way. They are both equally saved by God and God has love for men and women alike. But nevertheless, there is a role for each to play. There is a, a role that God has given to the man to be the loving leader in the home and to be serving in that capacity as best he can. And he has given to the wife as well a place and a role for her in the home to love her husband and to respect her husband and to be submissive. Even to the point that, as Peter uses the illustration here, that if the husband be one of those ornery rogues that has made a profession of faith perhaps and then has walked away from the church, that the woman, by her sweetness, by her submission to her husband in things that are lawful and just, would win her husband's love and attention and win her husband's ideas and win over her husband for the Lord because of her godly submission and love to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he gives those cautions in this place, and it seemed necessary in Peter's day, and I guess that men and women and Things haven't changed that much since the first century and yea, since the beginning of time, no doubt. But our ladies must be careful about their adornment because your adornment catches the eye of many a man. Your adornment catches the eye of more than just men. And you need to be careful that it's not all about what you can put on to make yourself pretty, but it's what you do in here that makes yourself pretty to God. 
And he says the thing that God seems to value with a great price is this topic of submission. It's a beautiful thing. It's a costly value in the eyes of God. It's so different than the world. It's so different than a world that says, nobody's going to tell me to submit. Who are you? You lug, you Neanderthal knuckle dragging lug. Do you think you're going to tell me what to do, how to walk, how to dress? You're going to tell me where I'm going to go. And if I'm going to go to church, what if I don't want to go? I'm going to do what I want to do. That's not submission. That's not the kind of thing that we see in Holy Scripture where a woman obeying her Lord, looking to her Lord ultimately, when her husband's will lines up with the, with the perceptive will of God, then she must follow that will. That is the word of the Lord. Oh, dear friends, and it comes down also to this very next category. And though Peter doesn't use the word submission with reference specifically in the text to the husband, there is this idea of submission to Christ and submission to the word that must be admitted. Look at that verse 7 again. You husbands, in the same way. In the same way. What way? The way of submission. Submission to who? I'm nobody's uh, slave. That's what the Jews said. And Jesus showed that they were in subject to the, to the devil. The, the friends, he's speaking about our subjection, your husband here, subjection to Christ, subjection to the word of God, submissiveness to him. In the same way, submit to the word of God, which is telling you to live with your wives in an understanding way. Know who they are. Know what makes them tick. Know what's important to them. Know how you can help them grow in grace and in the knowledge of their Lord and Savior. Help them to know that they are appreciated. Help them by sitting down with them and reading through those kinds of weighty theological matters that would concern her and her heart the most. And if she has a mind that is given to a theological bent, then you better bone up, buddy. <laughs> you better get your theology books out and study with her and learn with her. In the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, he goes on and applies this in this way. As with someone weaker. Now, if you've ever worked in a, in a situation where there's a dependence upon something of your stamina or your strength, in maybe early days, men, you worked in a factory position or you worked out on a, on a job that demanded a lot of physical uh, attention from you, and there was someone who wasn't quite of the same stature and didn't have the same muscle mass as you did, and it seemed like you were doing all the work. Peter is saying, in the same way, in the same way, live with your wives, understanding. Sometimes you've got to share the burden. Sometimes you've got to pick up. Sometimes you better carry the clothes up from the basement up the stairs. Right? Sometimes we need to remember this word that Peter is giving to us. And this since she is a woman is no degradation, derogation at all. Since she is a woman, it ought to be the plea to your heart. It ought to be the appeal that says, that's right, since she's my woman, I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to do what it takes to make this work. Shame on us putting in any other context than that. Since she's a woman, there ought to be a, a tenderness, an appeal to the love of your heart in this matter. Because he goes on, and then he says, show her honor. Honor. Show her honor. It's kind of like the man in Proverbs 31, right? Whose wife was the one who got up early and went out into the markets and bought all that she needed, bought the piece of land, knew how to run the business, came back, stayed up late, so that all the family and the, 
that household servants could be taken care of. And what does the Bible say? Her husband called her in the gates, in the place of business. He rises up and he calls her blessed. I think that's what Peter's arriving at here. Give honor to your wife. Men, instead of going around mumbling and grumbling about this or that that your wife does or doesn't understand or doesn't seem to want to do, leave those things far behind you. Don't even bring them up. Rather, put honor on her. Talk about how, what a blessing she's been to you and how she's done so much for you and how she's tolerated your foolish mistakes, your errors and judgment, and how that she still loves you and wants to follow you as a wife. Ah, oh, give her honor as the fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. A sure way to have your prayers unanswered is to lack giving honor to your wife because she's a fellow heir of the grace of God. Well, that's the idea of submission, and it works both ways then, doesn't it? Men, we need to submit to King Jesus in this. But then he gives a summary, a summary of all these activities of the good life it is under section 2 here. To sum up all of you, from those who are just submitting to governors, to those who are submitting to their employers, to those who are submitting to their husbands, and husbands that are submitting to the Lord and to others, to sum it up, all of you. It's talking to a church here, there's no doubt. Be harmonious. I love to hear four-part singing. And there's a congregation here that loves to sing four-part harmony. And when it's done right, and for the glory of God, it's a beautiful thing. I love to hear it. It's a beautiful sound. Peter is saying, congregation, be like that in all your affairs. Know what it's like to, to have the bass and the tenor and the alto and the soprano. Know what it is to blend the voices together in all of life. Be harmonious. Be sympathetic. Sympathetic. Pathetic. To have a pathos for others. To be sympathetic for them, with them. To work together with them. Brotherly. <laughs> Not like Cain and Abel. That didn't work out so good, did it? as Christian brothers and sisters in the Lord, with a new life and a new heart, we love one another. Kind-heartedness. Just a heart that's disposed. We wouldn't think anything less of anyone else. We would never attribute ill or evil to them. And humble in spirit. Let each one of you, says Paul in in Romans in the 12th chapter and about the third verse or so there, that we are to think others better than ourselves and to minister according to the grace of God given to us. Well, and then he says, not returning evil for evil. We've looked at this with what the Lord Jesus' behavior was back in chapter 2, or insult for insult. And how easy this is to, to get into, uh, to give a slap in the face and I can slap you in the face. I can, I can do that back to you and go back and forth. He said, don't do that. Instead, give a blessing. He says, instead. Blessing, instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit the blessing. Well, that's the, that's the summary of all the activities. And now the third specification is a shorter section again. And that third specification, the 3.0, is this, connecting or making the good life your own. We've talked about the fact that there is such a thing and that there is this heart, desire within all mankind to seek to have a good life. It's just that because of sin, we've forgotten what that good life is and consists of. And that number two, we found the spec that that life is found only in Christ. And now number three, how do I connect or make the good life my own? Well, again, we see this all in Verses 10 through 12. Repent is the very first thing. Repent. If you, haven't, if you haven't repented towards God for your sin, 
You need to start there. Well, look what he says. The one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil. That's a call to repentance. You must keep your tongue from evil. Well, what does that mean then, Greg? Stop trash talking God and others. That's what evil talking is. Trash talking God. Talking about God in a blasphemous, railing manner. Well, if I was on the throne, I'd sure do things different. Well, it's not up to you. Who asked you? Who are you, O oh man, that you reply unto him who made you? Why have you made me this way? That's Holy Scripture from Romans in the ninth chapter. Stop trash talk, talking. God, did you know that there are six or seven things the Bible says that God hates? And did you know that one of the things that God says that he hates in this place in Proverbs 6.16 is when brothers gripe and dissemble and tear down and divide brother between brother. The Bible says God hates that. It's evil. And we need to be careful. And if we're doing that at all in any fashion, we need to stop, turn around, flee that, and go the other way. But secondly, another call to repentance we see in verse 11 is this. He must turn away from evil and do good. It's another call to repentance. Turn away. This is what repenting is. Now, the word metanoia is not the word for turning that is used here, but in other places in Holy Scripture in the New Testament, it is used. And it means a transformation, a change of heart, mind, and will about God and the things of God that he says is right and true. And we're called here specifically to turn away, turn around from that which is evil. Kagos even has an evil sounding word that is given. Think of it here. We're to turn from evil and to do good. We don't just, we don't just stop doing one thing and then just live in a vacuum, but we're told to do good. Do you remember the story, children, of Zacchaeus? Do you remember how that he went up in the little tree or the tree because he was a man short of stature and he wanted to see the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus stopped in the sycamore tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down because I must abide at your house today. The salvation has come to your home. And so he takes him home and Zacchaeus entertains him there. And in the process, God converts him and changes his heart. And what does Zacchaeus do? He comes out swinging against his former sins. And he says, I tell you, if I stole anything, I'm going to restore it fourfold. He starts doing good. That's what a Christian does. That's part of the good life. You do what's good and you do what's right to the glory of Jesus. But then it's not just about repentance, is it? It's about something else. And we see this also in verse 11. He must seek peace and pursue it. Peace. Irenaeus. Peace between brother and brother. Peace between sister and sister. Peace most of all between God and man because remember sin has created a, a chasm that we cannot cross and we are at enmity with our God and we need our Savior, to stand in between. And so to seek peace, we must first of all seek peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans chapter 5 tells us that having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have received that. It is now our possession. And so seeking peace starts with seeking Jesus if you haven't sought Jesus, seek him today. If you haven't looked him up, if you haven't prayed to him, if you haven't bowed the knee, if you haven't placed the heart before him on the altar, if you haven't done these things, go to him now. He's a merciful Savior, and he will save you. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, dear friends, do you hear do you hear the meaning of Peter in this and the meaning of the psalm when it says he must seek peace and pursue it? If you want the good life, if you want a, a life that's filled with peace and joy, the right kind of peace and joy, 
then pursue peace. Seek peace with God through God's Son, Jesus, by faith in the promises of God. That's the only way you're going to come to God and the only way that's pleasing to Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. But then, my dear friends, as the application of the text broadens and if we found peace with God, it of necessity demands and commands that we seek peace with our fellow men. And this is where it gets hard. Oh, we want forgiveness for our sins. We want to be right with God. We want to go to heaven. We want to have our ticket punched. But there is a realization of the peace of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit within our hearts that we love our brother as ourself and that we want to reconcile with them to our dying breath. We ought to want to be at, at one with those who have been on the out with us. Don't stand in the way of reconciliation. Don't let your pride stand in the way of being reconciled to your brothers who have called for you to be reconciled, who have pled with you, who have asked what they might do to encourage it. Be reconciled one to another. Oh, and then finally, in this, this, not only do we repent and not only do we by faith seek peace through Christ, but now we find that God's providence comes in as He works His sanctifying influence in our lives in the last, he says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. His ears uh, attend to their prayer. I, I should have read that in the other order. His ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This teaches us that the Lord watches over you and I. We are in Christ. His provident care is upon us. He, his eyes are always upon the righteous. He knows your steps. He's not going to forget one thing that you do for his name, even though it's filled and riddled with wrong motives. He still, for Jesus' sake, will bless it. This providence works out in your sanctification, in your knowing to pray, in your knowing how to pray, in your knowing not to walk in the way of evil men and to do that which is right. And that's what the context has been about. That's what Peter is about here in the light of the gospel. Oh, friends, the good life we have found is only in Christ. It is abundant. It is lavish. It is free. It is generous. It is gracious, merciful, and loving. And it's a life that causes us to point to God and say, thank you for all you've given me freely. All this undeserved goodness. It's not a life without trouble. It's not a life of someone sitting back on the sandy beaches of some um, Bermuda island, sipping Mai Tais or whatever it is that they sip with umbrellas in the in frozen drink. That's not the picture that the Bible paints for us. You may well go through deep troubles and trials, but dear friends, no that our life, the good life, is a life that's full and rewarding. And that when you lie on your deathbed, having pursued peace with all men so much as lies within you, that you can lie there with the comfort of God and the forgiveness of sin and surrounded by those who love you and know Jesus and go into His presence because of the blood of Jesus. This is the blessing you're called to, the good life in Christ. Amen. Our Father, we do pray for the blessing of Jesus to come upon us because of the good life, the good life that he earned for us, that he bestows upon us, grants to us freely. And so, Lord, let us live it out, though it be costly on this earth, though it requires of us Lord, repentance and faith and to deny ourselves and to follow after you. Lord, it is a life that is worthy. It's worthy of you because you're great and good. And help us, Lord, 
to have then a right picture of the good life in the midst of a generation and a time that sets store by so many physical things around us. Oh, Lord, help us to understand the eternal value of Christ crucified. Forgive us where we fail. Love us because of Jesus. And we ask in his holy name. Amen. Thank you.